I'm fed up with those who keep telling us that we are just animals. It's no wonder that people behave as if they're in the jungle when so many people are telling them this. Desmond Morris is writing it in his books, The Naked Ape and The Human Zoo, in which he is trying to see animal feelings and behavior in human beings. His brother, Johnny Morris, is doing it in a much more subtle way by looking at animals and trying to see human feelings and thoughts in them. Both of them are bringing the animal and the human world far too close for the Bible. For we are not animals. We may breathe the same air, we may have a similar digestive system, but we are not animals. If you tell a man he's an animal, you must expect him to behave that way. But I think it's an insult to the animal world. We are more barbaric to each other in the human race than animals have ever been known to be. We can sink to depths that no animal can sink to. And we can rise to heights to which no animal can rise. Now, philosophers have debated the difference between animals and men for many years. Some have said that men make tools, but since a girl you may be able to give me her name, went to live among a colony of chimpanzees in Africa, a Christian girl, by the way, took a Bible with her. She discovered that they made tools. And so that difference has disappeared from the anthropology books. Others have said, well, humans laugh. I suppose the hyena does in a way, but I don't think that's the difference. Others say, well, human beings talk to each other, but we're finding more and more about animal communication and even fish and how they talk to each other. Some have said that man's uniqueness lies in the fact that he cooks. And certainly the animals haven't discovered or used fire yet. But I believe the one basic difference between all the animals in the world and your preacher tonight is this. Man prays. Man prays. Not even Snoopy ever relates to the powers beyond. Charlie Brown and Lucy may sit and ask questions about the stars, but Snoopy never does. And even though a lot of human thoughts and feelings are put into that dog's mind and heart, nevertheless, Schultz, who was a Sunday school teacher until about two and a half years ago, and alas, has now become an agnostic, which has been reflected in Peanuts cartoons, nevertheless, he never dared to put religious thoughts into Snoopy's mind because that would be too grotesque to be believable. Oh, I can talk to my God about this, to my dog, I mean about this world. I can talk about walks and bones and scrapings and other things. And she can understand. I can't pray with my dog. And Trixie's never shown any desire to whatsoever. <laughs> now, we are going to look at this unique activity of the human race because it's way back there at the beginning as far back as we can dig into the history of our race we find that in the earliest days in the very earliest days the simplest most primitive human beings believed in a great power a great God who lived above the sky to whom you could speak to go to New Zealand for example I was very struck with the the spiritism still among the Maoris, I'm afraid it made me shiver. I, was, I felt insulted when the New Zealand Airlines presented me with a green plastic idol, if you like. What's the name for it? Tiki. That in our technological age, I should be presented with that for good luck as I flew in. I'm sorry, no insult to your country. We do the same here. But the Maoris have gods of the sky, of the sea, of rivers mountains. But I was fascinated to read that when they first came to New Zealand a thousand years ago when nobody lived in that land and when they came they believed in one God only and he was a God who lived above the sky called Yah which is the first part of the word Yahweh which is God's name. You find the same among the, the Aborigines of Australia. You find the same among the Pygmies. And anthropology has discovered that the worship of things on earth is a later addition, a corruption of man's early knowledge that there was one God above the sky, a power beyond the stars to whom you could relate, to whom you could talk. 
And so men have prayed down through the ages. It's almost an instinctive thing. And I suppose that the majority of people, certainly in this land, and I think I'm fair in saying throughout the world, pray. At some time or another, they pray. And they know that the human race is insufficient to solve its own problems. And they reach out in however vague and misty a way. And they pray. If they just say, oh God, they pray. Even an atheist says, I'm an atheist, thank God. <laughs> and, it's, and even the word atheist has in the middle of it theos, which is the Greek for God. And we can't even define unbelief except in terms of not believing in God. And so we pray. It's an instinctive thing. And yet I'm going to be speaking the next few Sunday evenings about Christian prayer, which is not instinctive but distinctive. There is, it is not the same thing for a Christian to be on his knees praying as a Tibetan monk revolving his prayer wheel. Or a Muslim with his mat out facing Mecca. There are profound differences between prayer and Christian prayer is unique and distinctive. The rest is instinctive and, and spreads right through the human race and takes many forms. But Christian prayer is distinctive. And I want to tell you what's distinctive about it. First, for many in this world, prayer is a private thing. For the Christian, prayer can never be private. A Christian can never pray alone. Never. You see, Islam is making a deliberate attempt, make no mistake about it, Islam is making a deliberate attempt to evangelize Britain. I saw the culture exhibition last Tuesday morning in London. I've seen one of the TV programs which was superb. I've heard already tonight of someone linked with someone in this congregation who is being convinced by that propaganda that here is the true faith at last. That here is the simple faith. It is a simple faith. And you can pray alone in this faith. You and God alone. There is no God but Allah. Muhammad is his prophet, but you don't even need Muhammad. You just need Allah and you, and you can pray. And two's company and three's none. And you can pull out your mat anywhere, the right hour, and you and God alone can pray. Now, a Christian can never do that. The very minimum for a Christian to pray is four persons present. That's the absolute minimum. And it is very rarely that you can pray with that absolute minimum. Very rare. The absolute minimum is you, the Father, the Son, and the Spirit. You pray to the Father, through the Son, and in the Spirit, or it's not Christian prayer. So at least four of you are involved. Therefore, a Christian can never pray alone. He's got to have a prayer meeting of four. <laughs> Furthermore, as soon as you get on your knees, the devil is involved and interested. That's one of the reasons why prayer is such a battle and such a problem. So that makes five of you. And you discover that he never comes alone. And when you pray, you will find if you really get through to the heavenly places that there are a lot of others joining in and you will be wrestling not against flesh and blood but against principalities and powers in the heavenly places. And that comes in the context of praying that sentence in Ephesians 6. So they're going to be involved. And therefore there is safety in numbers and therefore there are many special promises in Scripture to Christians that if two or three of you agree on earth as touching anything, then your prayer is going to be powerful. So how many have we got now? See, there's no such thing as private prayer, one-to-one, -one in Christianity. There is in every other religion. But to Christians, prayer is never private. It's always a very public event. You're getting into the front line. You're getting into an arena. You're surrounded by a great cloud of witnesses. You're wrestling with principalities and powers. You're praying to the Father, through the Son, and in the Spirit. You've got the devil at your heels with all his minions behind him. The angels are interested too over one sinner who's repenting. And, and in fact, it's just a very public occasion. And I'm not quibbling because here's my first practical hint and I'm going to be throwing out practical tips to you to try and help you in these talks. Have you ever noticed that when Jesus taught you how to pray privately, quote, he said, go into a room, shut the door and say, our Father. Have you ever noticed that? Not my Father. He was the only one who used that phrase. He said, when you pray privately, alone, shut the door and say, we 
give us our daily bread. Have you ever noticed that? He is saying as, as clearly as he could, there's no such thing as private prayer. It's always public. It's always part of a family. It's always part of a crowd. And in fact, whatever need you have, others in God's family have that same need at that point, and you can pray for them with yourself. That's why on a number of occasions when I've taken a funeral, in the first prayer I have prayed and led the mourners to pray for other funerals taking place at that time and other people mourning. Because there are others. And in a funeral you can be preoccupied with your own grief. It's give us. Ah, it's a public occasion. There's another difference too. For many in the world, prayer is meditation, but for Christians it is not meditation, it is conversation. And I, I must speak very clearly and carefully now because the concept of prayer as meditation as a higher form of prayer has crept within Christian circles. It's been in Christian circles for centuries. It came in from Eastern mysticism and it is not biblical prayer. The idea is this, that if you're still at the stage of simply asking for things and talking to God, that you're in the primary department of prayer. And that once you've stopped talking and asking for things and have learned just to think about things, you've moved up a stage in prayer to meditation. And that you can even move on from that. And transcendental meditation would say move on from that to thinking about nothing. And then you're really there. <laughs> now it's not just coming in the form of TM. There is a Christian mysticism that has got it upside down and thinks that talking to God and asking him for things is a very low form of prayer. Let me ask you to do a little biblical checking. Go through everything Jesus said about prayer and 95% of it is about talking and about asking. 95% of it. To Jesus, prayer was talking and asking, not thinking. There is a place for meditation in the Christian life. It is to meditate in God's word. Not to think of nothing and see what comes into your mind. But to meditate in God's law day and night. There's a place for meditation. But it's meditation with content. And that's not prayer. Prayer is talking to God and asking him for things. If the teaching of Jesus is anything to go by. And that is the highest form of prayer, not the lowest. Furthermore, if you study Jesus' own prayer life, you will find that the same holds true. Study his prayer in Gethsemane. Study John 17, which is the fullest prayer we have of Jesus, and count up how many things he asks for. He is not meditating, he is talking and he's asking all the way through. That then is the heart of Christian prayer. And so let's realize, simple though it is, that talking to God about our needs and his desires is prayer. And when the disciples said, Lord, teach us to pray, he didn't give them a meditational system. He gave them a simple form of words to say out loud, not to think. He didn't say, when you pray, think. He said, when you pray, say. And then he told them six things, and every one of them was asking. Three things that God wanted them to ask for, and three things that they would want to ask for themselves. But it was speaking, and it was asking. And that was prayer. Now that is so profound, yet so simple. I say it because even Christians get lost in mystical meditation and think they've got into a higher form of prayer. Prayer is simple. It is a child telling his father what he needs. That's the heart of it. And if I can go a little further and say, I do not find scriptural warrant for thinking that you've had a better time together if it's all been praise and there's been no asking. God likes prayer and praise and he doesn't value them over against each other. And yet we can sometimes think that if we've had a time of praise and never asked for anything, that God must somehow be more pleased than if we brought a shopping list. But he's a father who loves us to express our needs. And Jesus said, go and tell him what you need. That's what he wants to hear. There was a great violinist 
famous violinist and his own son learned the violin but not from his father he learned from another violinist who was not nearly as good as his father and someone said to the father why did you not teach him and the violinist said because he never asked me he never asked that father was just waiting for the boy to say please would you teach me and that's what God is waiting for people just to say please they can praise him when the answers come but study our Lord's teaching on prayer and it is speaking and asking here's tip number two you will find it very much easier when you are alone quote to pray if you pray out loud are you troubled by wandering thoughts then try words Words don't wonder like thoughts do. It's such an obvious thing to say, but try it. Do you know one of the reasons why many Christians find it difficult to pray aloud in a prayer meeting is that they've never prayed aloud privately. And they've never got used to the sound of their own voice. So they've got a double psychological barrier to get over in praying in front of others. They've not only got to pray in front of others, they've got to pray in front of themselves. When you want to pray, said Jesus, go into a room, shut the door, and say, and say, how simple. How did we miss it? And yet the majority of Christians I counsel and speak to in this country think their prayers, which is a very difficult thing to do. Much harder than just to say them. And Jesus said, say, our Father. Trying to be simple in these talks, you may think I'm being a bit obvious, even quibbling, but I want to be helpful and practical. And if you're way past all this, then God bless you. I'll try and, I'll try and catch up with you someday, but I want to start where people are. <laughs> now, the next thing that I want to say is this. As soon as you mention the subject of prayer, people say, I wonder if he's going to deal with the problems of prayer. And I want to begin by telling you about the privilege of prayer. If you begin with the problems, you're, you're finished. My wife and I read certain books before our marriage, and they were very helpful, but we got to a point where we read too much. We thought, my, number of things that can go wrong. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, we were reading too much about the problems. You can get worried about the problems. And so we began to think of the privilege. And I want you to concentrate on the privilege rather than the problems. There are problems. There are difficulties. We'll mention them as we go along. But let's start tonight with the privilege. The sheer honor it is to be able to do it. Now, some time ago, I was standing on the curbside in a street in London, and a, a beautiful maroon Rolls Royce drew up right there at the traffic lights, just a yard from me. Beautiful. I looked at the Rolls Royce first, then I thought, I'll see who's inside. And there, about a yard from me, looking at me through the window, was Her Majesty the Queen. And I've never been quite so embarrassed. I didn't know quite know what to do. <laughs> so <laughs> she, she sort of looked at me, and I, I sort of went like this. And, <laughs> and, and she sort of went like this. <laughs> but there was a sort of plate glass between us, and that was, that was as near as we got. And then... Uh, sailed on you know supposing she'd wound down the window and said hello <laughs> and supposing she'd said here's my car drop in and see me sometime <laughs> or supposing she said here's my telephone number if you want anything just get on the blower no she wouldn't have told like that would she <laughs> <laughs> well you've left but I tell you this a hotline to Buckingham Palace which you could use at any time is nothing compared to the privilege of prayer. Nothing. For the Queen doesn't have a millionth of the resources that God has. That is the privilege of prayer. It's not a problem, it's a privilege. Start there. To have a hotline. I sometimes find myself amazed at just assuming that I can just close my eyes or even keep them open and just say God and I'm through incredible do you know really if he just granted me one interview in a lifetime that would be a privilege wouldn't it just one so we start there 
And it's for that reason that I'm going to say more things. I'm sure I'll have a lot of comeback. I know you'll write to me and you'll say all sorts of things and I'm sure you'll be right too because I don't have the whole truth and you'll have your aspects. But I want to say that I do believe that it's not a question of mastering the mechanics so much as practicing the presence. And that too many people are looking for a method of prayer. And that's what develops a ritual. It doesn't develop a relationship. And greatly daring, I say the Bible has nothing to say about what we tend to call a quiet time. It says pray at all times. It does not say have a quiet time. Now I want you to think through the implications of that. I want you to imagine me as a husband saying to my wife, I'm going to love you every Wednesday and Friday evening, prompt at 9.30, and you can have a whole half hour of my time and I'll set the alarm clock. How about that? Is that a relationship? I believe that it is not so much mastering the mechanics or having a method as practicing the presence. And I'm quoting their brother Lawrence, who in his kitchen practiced the presence of God so that as he scrubbed pots and pans, it was as natural to talk to his father and to ask for what he needed. So it's a privilege rather than a problem. You see, if you really want to do a thing, you find a way. If a young man looks around in church and sees a young lady he rather fancies, he'll find a way. He'll form his own mechanics, he'll send her a letter, or he'll just be around in the lounge afterwards or in the foyer, or he'll send her a valentine next February, or he'll do something. If he wants to get through, he'll find a way. It's the person who matters more than the place or anything else. And it's the master who matters more than the method. Next thing I want to say is this. For many, prayer is fortune, but for Christians, it's faith. I mean by fortune that for many, prayer is, is a game of chance. It's a game of luck, as if God's a kind of heavenly Huey Green with a big barrel. And we all send our prayers up, and he puts them in the big barrel and turns the handle, opens it up, and now and again he pulls out your name and address, and he gives you an answer. People who've sent up many, many prayers and got just one or two answers back seem to think it's a matter of luck that it comes up about as often as a premium bond is likely to. Now, lest you think I'm lampooning, let me read you something that I received through the post. It was called Think Prayer. And underneath that heading it said, Trust in the Lord with all your heart and he will light your way. And then it said this, This prayer has been sent to you for good luck. It originally came from the Netherlands. Sorry friends, but that's where it came from. It has been around the world nine times. The luck has been sent to you. You are to receive good luck within four days after receiving this copy. This is no joke. You will receive it in the mail. Send 20 copies of this letter to friends you think need good luck. Please do not send money. Do not keep this letter. It must leave within 96 hours after receiving it. A United States officer received $7,000. Don Elliott received $60,000 but lost it because he broke the chain. Well, hard luck. <laughs> now, the more serious side. While in the Philippines, General Wapak, whoever he is, lost his life six days after receiving this copy and failing to circulate this prayer. However, before his death, he received $775,000, <laughs> which he had won and which he had to leave behind. I shot an arrow into the air, it fell to earth, I know not where. It's how many people do feel about asking God for things, that it's chancy, it's worth trying, it may work. But for Christians, prayer is not fortune. Prayer is faith. There's a certainty. If there's one principle that takes the luck out of prayer, takes the chance out of it, it is the principle about which I'm speaking tonight. The principle of faith. And though there are other principles that will qualify what I'm going to say tonight, tonight I'm going to concentrate on this one thing, faith. And my text, if you want a text, is just four words from Jesus' lips. Have faith in God. For tonight I'm going to speak on praying to God. 
Next Sunday I'm going to speak on praying through Jesus. Later I'll speak on praying in the Spirit. And then I'll speak on praying against the devil. And then I'll speak on praying with the saints. Then I'll speak on praying by ourselves. Then I'll, I'll just go on as long as the series lasts. But tonight it's praying to God. And Jesus said, have faith in God. Or to give you the flavor of the Greek again, go on having faith in God. It's not a once and for all that you did at the day of your conversion. Go on having faith in God. That's the foundation of prayer and it must be there before prayer can be more than a chancy business. If it's to be love rather than luck, have faith in God. Now some people may assume that what I mean by that phrase is that I must believe that what I ask I will receive. That is only the seventh thing that is involved in my mind in the phrase, have faith in God. There are six things that you must believe previously before you can believe you'll get your answer. And I run through them quickly one by one. Seven things which make up faith in God which gets answers to prayer. Number one, I must believe that God is there. Did you notice it in Hebrews 11? Whoever would come to God must believe that he exists. That's the first item in faith, if I'm going to pray in faith. I must believe that God is there. The atheist says he's not there. The agnostic says, I don't know. The atheist doesn't pray at all. The agnostic does when he's in a jam, but he doesn't know if it's going to be answered. The Christian says, I believe that he's there. That he's there. Talking to yourself is no use. Some people think that a period of auto-suggestive meditation is helpful each day. But I'm not very keen to talk to myself. Don't like listening to what I've got to say, for one thing. I'm not a very good conversationalist with myself. And if you do too much talking to yourself, that's the first step on a slippery slope, mentally speaking. If prayer is just talking to myself, then I'm not going to do it. I must believe that God is there to talk to. That's step number one. Now, my physical faculties can't tell me that he's there. That's the first problem. You see, I have no problem talking to someone I can see or whose arm I can grasp or even somebody I can smell who's there. I have no problem. But in prayer, you're talking to someone you can't see and someone you can't hear and someone you can't hold or touch. You can't smell and you can't taste. And therefore, it feels a bit unreal. My mental faculties can't tell me that he's there either because the great philosophers of the world have failed to agree on whether there's a God or not. They've used every ounce of intellect they have. They've deduced, they've argued logically, and they cannot tell me whether there is a God or not. Some philosophers say there is, some say there isn't. So neither my physical nor my mental faculties can tell me. Therefore, I am driven back to a spiritual faculty, faith. And that's the only faculty that can tell me he's there. Did you notice that I didn't say feeling? One of the basic problems of prayer is this, and so many people have said it, I don't feel that he's there. You show me in the Bible where it says you need to. It only says you have to have faith that he's there. Sometimes you will feel him so close that you almost feel you could touch him. Other times you will not. The Bible is indifferent to whether you feel his presence or not. It says, do you have faith that he's there? Not feeling. Do you have faith that he's there? Whoever would pray must believe that he exists. That's point number one. So his word is enough and he's a gentleman of his word. He always keeps it. And by faith, I can say, whether I feel like it or not, I can say, Our Father, you are in heaven. You're there. Now, point number two. I must believe not only that God exists, I must believe that he is personal. That he is someone and not something. You see, there are many colloquial synonyms for God. Many phrases that people use. Do you know one of the latest used by Christian theologians? Or it's getting out of date a bit now, but the Bishop of Woolwich made it popular in the book Honest to God. That you call God the ground of our being. I find it rather difficult talking to the ground of my being. <laughs> Don't you? Others say the life force. It's not easy to talk to a force. 
you might as well pray to an electric socket in the wall. <laughs> There's power there, but it's a thing, it's not a person. And I must believe before I pray that not only is God there, but that God is someone, not something. Most people say, well, there's something greater than the universe. There's some power out there. But it's not a power you pray to. It's a person you pray to. Prayer is unreal if you try to talk to a power. And the Bishop of Woolwich admitted that since he believed in God as the ground of his being, his prayer life had been shot to pieces because he didn't know who to pray to. He was holding a conversation with the ground of his own being. In other words, talking to himself. A student up at the College of Law in Guildford I was talking to about this very matter said, God, that is only a name for my religious feelings. And he meant it. So I said, well, you can't pray to your own religious feelings. He said, no, I can't. I don't. So we believe he's personal. Why? I'll tell you why. Because the Bible says, I am like God, and therefore that means God is like me. Isn't that exciting? I feel, I think, I act. Why do I do that? Because I'm made like God, therefore he's like me. I'm not making God in my image, I'm made in his. But the result is the same, we are like each other. And you can talk to people that you like, right? I've heard people say, you know, I just couldn't keep up a conversation with that person. They're just so different from me in outlook, in temperament, in background. I just can't talk to them freely. They're so unlike me. But praise God by faith, I can believe that God is like me. Because I'm like him. Therefore I can talk. And that requires a big step of faith. And that he's not just a person. Notice that I didn't say believing that God is a person. But to believe that he is personal. Which means something more than that he's a person. Because he's more. He's three persons. And he has always known how to communicate between persons. Because he is three persons communicating. Now, this to me is the most exciting difference between Allah and Jehovah, the Father of our Lord Jesus. The God of Islam is only one, therefore he is not love. He cannot be because no one person by themselves can be love. And therefore the statement, God is love, does not appear in al Quran. It appears in the Bible. You see, Allah, if Allah is God, then there was a time when Allah was all by himself. There was nobody else, no angels, no people, no one. So how could Allah love? Do you understand what I'm saying? God is personal. Father's been talking with son and son with father from all eternity. So he's personal and I can get in on the conversation. I can break in because I'm like him and I can communicate and I can talk. He communicates. He is love. And it's as if the three of them, the three of him, I don't quite know how to put it. It's almost too wonderful for words. As if the three are opening their arms and saying, join the circle and communicate with us. We are personal. Let us make man in our image. And they talk together about it before they made us. Isn't that lovely? Now the third thing in faith and I must hurry on, is this. I must take a step of faith that God has good ears, that he can hear. Now, you can hear me now because, well, I'm not raising my voice too much, but I've got this thing, and that's helping. That's amplifying my voice so that you can hear right at the back. If I shouted, they might hear out in the street. I can pick up a telephone and be heard over a greater distance. When I was in New Zealand, I got through to my wife here in less than one minute. And we talked via two satellites out in space and back down again. And with no discernible lag between question and answer. Marvelous. We talked to a man on the moon with only a slightly discernible time lag. Oh yes, we're getting further and further out. But I tell you this, that from the very beginning a man who prayed could be heard in highest heaven. It takes big faith to believe that. That God can hear out of the millions of voices, there are two problems, you see. There's the problem of distance. How far away is God? He's in highest heaven. Where's that? I haven't a clue. I just know that my voice reaches highest heaven. That when Malcolm Waldron prayed earlier in the service, his voice reached highest heaven. But there's a problem of numbers too. Have you ever been in a room where so many people are talking you can't hear? 
If you are one of those who has to wear a hearing aid, you'll understand because a hearing aid can't direct itself and it picks up every cough, every noise, every voice. It's very difficult to pick out the one person you're trying to listen to. And I just wonder how many people God is listening to at this very minute. And he hears every word. There are 4,000 million of us on the earth and he hears every word. He knows every word even before I utter it. He knows when I got out of that chair. He knows when I sat down. And he heard every word. He's hearing every word at this very minute in highest heaven. It takes faith to believe that, but it's true. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It's high. I can't attain to that. I can't listen to more than one person at once. But God is God. Which brings me to the next thing. The faith that he will listen. There's a difference between being able to hear and listening. Sometimes I'm told that I'm a bad listener. I know that's true. I have no trouble with my hearing, but I sometimes have trouble with my listening. But faith says God not only can hear my prayer, but he will listen to it. And the extraordinary thing is that we think we have a right to be heard. We have a right to live. We have a right to health. We have a right to happiness. So we have a right to demand these things from God as if he's, as if he's a welfare state to us. What right have we to be heard? What right have I to demand a listening ear from God? People have said to me, well, I didn't ask to be put in this world. I didn't create myself. God put me here. So I have a right to ask for health and happiness from him. You have no such right. And I'll tell you why very simply. Because when God put us in this world and made this world and made us in it, he said, that's very good. Now keep it that way. And not one of us has done so. Therefore, we have forfeited the right to be listened to. We have no right. It is not justice if God listens. It is mercy. But by faith you can believe that God will not only hear what you say, but that he listen. Do you realize how many barriers there could be between you and God? If there is only one sin in your life each day, over the last 30 years, there are now 10,000 sins between you and God. What right have you to be heard? Only if your sins are dealt with have you the right to be heard. And yet God listens. He loves to listen. Not because of what I am, but because of what he is. Because he's a person of such love that he loves to listen. He loves us to tell him of our needs. Next, we've only two more, three more. I must believe that God will not only listen, but that he will reply. Isn't conversation miserable if it's one-sided? If you have to do all the talking. You know, nice weather we're having. Nice weather yesterday, wasn't it? Hope it'd be nice weather tomorrow. And it's a one-way conversation and you're having to keep it up. It's miserable. And conversation, which is more prayer with God than meditation, conversation is a two-way thing. And to believe that God will reply is part of the faith that is needed. Have faith in God. That he exists. That he's personal. That he can hear that he will listen, that he can reply, that he has a mouth as well as ears. The important thing to do is when we pray, not to tell God how he must reply. Here again is a practical tip coming up. If you lay down beforehand how he must reply, you are likely to miss his reply. And he changes his methods of reply. There are many. I could list only a few. Let me just mention first. He can reply by vibrating the air so that your physical ear can hear his voice. He really can. But when he does, it sounds like a clap of thunder. And I'm just grateful that he doesn't reply that way too often. But you're only hearing my voice now because my little voice box is vibrating air down there. It's coming out of here. And it's going into here, and these speakers are vibrating the air. It's simply vibrations. You can't hear my voice. You can only hear the air moving. And God can make the air move. And just as you can hear the thunder from that jet plane, when God speaks, it sounds like that thunder. And on a number of occasions in the Bible, he spoke like that, and the people said, it's thundering. Some people caught the words, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Yes, he could speak that way. Thank God he doesn't, too often. Those who like quiet, dignified worship would certainly not come near church if God spoke every time like that. He can speak to us through the Bible. 
There are times when you're reading that book and a verse just seems to leap out as if it's written in shining letters with your name and address on it. But how fatal if he's spoken to you like that one way to try and get the answer that way the next time. He can speak to you through an inner voice which is so clear that you can even think that you heard it with these ears. Sometimes going out of church, people have said to me, you know, when you said this, that was just God's word for me. Now, I can remember everything I've said in a sermon immediately afterwards, and I know that I've not said that. And they were convinced that I did, but it was God who spoke so clearly within their heart that they heard him. They thought I said it. Because listening to me, they were open to listening to him. He can speak through circumstances, astonishingly. In the most ordinary ways. He can speak through another human voice, either through an immediate word of prophecy or through a casual remark in a conversation. And he's answered. The important thing is not how he answers or even when he answers. The important thing is to believe that when I pray, he will reply. Sometimes he doesn't reply to the last minute. But faith believes that he will reply in time. It doesn't dictate how or when that reply should come. Sometimes it comes immediately. I think back over my life to certain crucial steps which led me to stand here as your preacher tonight and I see a total variety of ways in which God spoke. When I thought of going into the ministry, I said one morning, Lord, you must tell me before midday today if you want me in the ministry. And I had coffee at about 11 o'clock with my friend. We were both training to be farmers. And he looked at me and he said, you know, David, and this was right out of the blue, he said, I think you'll finish in a pulpit and not behind a plow. So I left him. And I went out into the street and bumped straight into a retired minister who looked straight at me and out of the blue said, David, when are you going to get into the ministry? <laughs> now here was God speaking through other people. As clearly as you could ask before noon that day. I think of when the time came for me to face the fact that I was a heretic in the denomination in which I was a minister as far as the matter of baptism went and had to appear before a doctrinal committee made up of theologians of that denomination. And I didn't relish the prospect at all. And about two weeks before, I was on holiday in a little fishing village on the coast of Northumberland, and a dear fisherman got up in the pulpit and he read God's word from Hebrews, I will not fear what man shall do to me. And out of God's word... He just spoke and all fear left and though we lost job, home, pension, everything. God spoke. His word just came alive. And the fear went. And then I think of the next voice through circumstances when Gold Hill Baptist Church said, we are calling you to be the pastor. Will you come? I said, well, I'm sorry. I can't come till next April the 30th. That's the earliest date I could come. This was about November he said, isn't that strange? We're building a manse. And the builder told us that it would be finished on April the 30th. And it was, and we moved in on April the 30th. Circumstances. Then I think of coming to Guildford and how twice this church wrote to me and said, will you come to Guildford and be pastor? And twice I wrote back and said, nothing doing. Or words to that effect. <laughs> <laughs> and then one morning as I was in bed, not feeling very well that day, there, up on the wallpaper, was the word Guildford. I said, Lord, should I not have said no? My wife brought in the breakfast on a tray, and there were the letters on the plate, and the top letter had a Guildford postmark. And she will remember my turning to her after reading the letter and saying, we're going to Guildford. Oh, you look back, and God speaks in a thousand and one ways. The important thing is to believe that he's going to reply, not to tell him how or when. <laughs> Hope I'm being practical enough. The next thing I want to say is this, to believe that God can act, that he's a living God in living control of the situation. And that prayer changes things and not just people. Now, I'm going to give you a little philosophy lesson, I'm sorry, but there are three philosophies in the world. Theism, deism, monism. Theism says... God created and controls this universe. Deism says God created this universe, but he can't control it. It's like a watch that he made and wound up, and it now controls itself. Monism says this world created itself and controls itself. Now, monism doesn't pray at all, 
that deism is far too common inside the church. Deism says you can pray about people because God can change people, but you can't pray about things because God is no longer in control of them. For example, you can't pray about the weather, for that is controlled by natural laws. Pray about yourself and patience for yourself. Pray about the sick. But don't pray about the weather because God no longer controls it. It's controlled by depressions and other things. A theist says God not only created, he controls. Do you know this afternoon, I, just while I was preparing, I listened to Mendelssohn's Elijah, that matchless oratorio which we listened to out at Engev on the Sea of Galilee on Easter Sunday evening very late. I thought of Elijah and I looked out at the garden and how dry it was. Even that little bit of rain last night has done nothing to touch it. It's dry as dry. And I thought, I wonder if a prophet in Britain would dare to say, God, stop the rain for three and a half years until we come to our senses. Here we are after just a few months of light rainfall beginning to get worried. And I began to realize what Elijah did by prayer. That righteous man stopped the rain for three and a half years. Can you imagine what would happen to Britain if that happened? We're far more likely to be on our knees quickly begging for rain as soon as the tap runs dry. But Elijah didn't. He saw the real need of the people and he said, God, stop that rain for three and a half years. And we were in the hot come scene, the desert wind. We, we felt how it dried everything up. And to think of that for three and a half years. And then he prayed again and it started. And when we were on Mount Carmel at the very spot where he challenged the prophets of Baal. And you can go to uh, Peter Melitus. Have you got it in your hand there, Peter? You have a photograph of a cloud the size of a man's hand right above us. Just a cloud. And we knew the Hamsin was over and the wind was blowing from the Mediterranean. There it is. He's holding it up. Can you see it? It's a cloud the size of your fist. And it was right above where Elijah was. You see, Elijah believed that God can control, that he can act, that he's a living God. Watchman Nee did the same thing. Do you remember the story? Have you read it in Sit, Watch, Sit Walk Stand? He and a young boy went to evangelize an island off the mainland of China. And when they got there, they found a, a, a fertility cult that worshipped a God who sent the rain. And every year they had an annual procession of this idol down the street carried by the priests. They always chose the dry weather and they walked down in the sun and they asked this God to bring the rain a few weeks later and the rain came. And they tried preaching the gospel and nothing happened. And, and as they prayed about it, this 14-year-old boy said to Watchman Nee, why don't we do an Elijah on them? <laughs> and Watchman Nee, his faith was not quite up to it. But he said, all right, let's. And they prayed that on the day they brought the idol out, it would rain on the idol. And all through the next two weeks, three weeks, four weeks, five weeks, six weeks, the sky remained cloudless and blue. And when they got up on the morning of the procession, the sky was cloudless and blue. And their faith shook a little. And then they began the procession with the idol down the street and a cloud began to form and it spread quickly and the first drops came and it poured and the priest carrying the idol slipped and it smashed. And the priest hurriedly stuck it together and they announced publicly that they had made a mistake about the date and they would bring the God out so many weeks later. And Watchman Nee said, it will not rain until that day you bring him out again and then it will rain again. And it did. And the island turned to the Lord. So you've got to believe that God is still in control. That he can act. He can change things, not just people. Harold, do you mind my mentioning you? No. Our first Easter sunrise service, do you remember that? Saturday morning, we met for our Saturday morning prayer meeting, depressed because the weather forecast was bad. And it was the first the first sunrise service in Guildford as far as we knew and we felt it was for the glory of the Lord and I can remember your prayer yet. You said, Lord, you've heard the weather report but you're our weatherman because you produce it. And if you recall, we prayed for his glory not for the sake of our service, our organization. That's different from praying for a nice day for your Sunday school outing. We prayed for his glory, the first sunrise service. 
And that Sunday morning was the record sunshine for 16 years in Guildford. Dismiss it as a coincidence? You're welcome to. I'd rather live in a series of coincidences. But that requires faith that God is in control, that he hasn't made the world and left it to run on natural laws. The natural laws are to God what the school rules are to the headmaster, and he can change them any time he wants. The last thing that we need to believe is this, that God will give what we ask for. Now, you'd have thought I'd have mentioned that first, talking about praying in faith, wouldn't you? But I don't. I mention it last. All these other things need to be believed first, that God really is there, that he is personal, that he can hear, that he will listen, that he can reply, that he can act. Then, if I'm sure of those six things, then I can pray in faith that I will have what I ask for. It's that kind of faith that gets answers. Jesus said, and listen to these words, Therefore I tell you, Whatever you ask, that's an incredible statement, whatever you ask in prayer, believe that you have it and you will. That's an incredibly strong statement. And his brother James, writing many years later, said, but when you ask, don't doubt. You're like a wave being tossed in the sea. Don't doubt. This is the problem. Doubts come in. Worry comes in. Will it happen? Will it be all right? And as Jesus taught us, worry is a libel on your heavenly Father. Oh, you of little faith. There's so many stories now, I just don't know where to begin. I think of that Lincolnshire plowboy, John Hunt, taught himself to read his Bible by balancing it on his plow handles while he plowed the fields of Lincolnshire. Taught himself Greek and Hebrew the same way. Went out at the age of 26 to Tonga and Fiji as the first missionary. And led to those islands, turning to Christ within 10 years. Then he died at 36, worn out with his labors. But John Hunt, when he went out by ship, he got within sight of of Fiji. And the ship was wrecked on the coral reef and was breaking up beneath their feet. And it looked as if all that journey had been for nothing and they would all be drowned. There was no hope. But John Hunt gets down on his knees on the deck and says, Lord, we've come to bring you gospel. Get us there. And when he opened his eyes to his hurry, he saw a great tidal wave bearing down on them. Tidal wave, where it started, some submarine submarine volcano moving somewhere way out in the Pacific. But a tidal wave of huge proportions bearing down on them. Instead of drowning them, it lifted what remained of the ship and just carried it a mile and dropped it on the shore. And every man walked off it. He believed. You know, I sometimes get a bit depressed by reading books on answers to prayer. Do you? You read the life of George Muller and Hudson Taylor and you just want to crawl away and give up. I'm going to suggest this. Look, there are two things to do with your faith. Two things not to do with it and two things to do with it. Let's be practical. Here are the two things not to do with it. Don't try and feel your faith. I've already mentioned that, but don't try and feel your faith. Your feelings go up and down. If they didn't, you wouldn't have any. But if you tie your faith to your feelings, your faith will go up and down too. Tie your feelings to your faith and then your feelings will follow your faith. Tie your faith to the facts. That's the right way around. So don't try and feel your faith and above all, don't try and force your faith. You can read the life of George Muller and then try and force yourself to open a big orphanage. Forcing faith doesn't work. What do you do to your faith? I'll tell you first, you stimulate it, then you stretch it. Stimulate your faith by listening to other answers to prayer. Can I give you one from a a 14 or 15 year old teenage boy in this congregation? He was on a school outing and while traveling on the coach, he wanted to eat the orange that had been given him with his packed lunch. The problem was what to do with the orange peel. The ashtrays were all jammed full and he didn't want to put it in his pocket. So what did he do? He prayed in faith and just asked God to deal with the problem. Another boy tapped him on the shoulder and said, what are you going to do with that peel? And he said, "Uh, why do you ask? Well, he said, I like eating it. Could I have it? (laughs) 
the boy who'd prayed, he may be here for all I know, deliberately went round the bus and asked every other boy, do you eat orange peel, do you eat orange peel, do you eat orange peel, and got a resounding no from every other boy. All right. It's amusing. But to me it's encouraging. Tremendously. Because he just asked about a simple problem. And the Lord heard. The Lord put it right. That's all of a piece with the Lord who turned water into wine when they got into a little embarrassment at a wedding reception at Cana of Galilee. Stimulate your faith by listening to answers to prayer. And stimulate your faith by reading the Bible. As you get into the Bible, you live in a world in which people talk to God and he talks to them. You live in a real world. It's fact, not fiction. It's not myth. It's not a science textbook, but it's not myth. It's a world in which real people brought their real needs to God, asked him about them and had them met. And the more you read your Bible, the more you live in that kind of a world and the more you will do what the people in the Bible did. Stimulate your faith. Don't try and feel it. Don't try and force it, but stimulate it. And secondly, stretch it from within. Now, I learned this lesson from a French missionary, a man in Paris, and I've told you the story before, but he said to me, David, he said, never pray outside your faith. And I thought, what on earth does he mean by that? I thought, well, that's silly. God is a God who's able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or even imagine. That's what Paul says in Ephesians 3. Therefore, thou art coming to a king, large petitions with thee bring. You know that hymn? And that's what the problem's been. I said, what do you mean he's able to do anything? He said, yes, he's able to, and he often will do more than you ask or imagine. But you pray within your faith. He said, I learned this lesson with my next door neighbor. When they moved in, I put them on my prayer list, and I began to pray daily for their conversion. And he said, nothing happened. Nothing happened. And finally he said, I said to the Lord, why are you not showing me any answer to my prayer? I'm praying daily for my neighbor. And the Lord said, because you don't believe it. He said, but Lord, you can do anything. And the Lord said, I know I can, but you don't believe it. He said, but I do, Lord. Anything is possible for you. And the Lord said, no, you don't. You can't imagine your neighbor as a Christian, can you? He said, no, I can't. <laughs> See, you don't believe it. All right, he said, I'll stop praying for his conversion. Lord, well, what do I pray? And the Lord said, pray for something you can imagine happening. Pray for something that you can believe will happen. So he prayed that he might have a good conversation with his neighbor, and within a week they'd had a great talk over the garden fence. So then he prayed that he might get into the house next door, which he'd never done. And, you know, very shortly after that, his neighbor asked him in for coffee. Then he prayed that the neighbor would bring the subject round to religion, and the neighbor said, where do you go every Sunday morning? Then he prayed that he might get the neighbor along to something at church, and the neighbor came. And you see what he was doing? He was stretching his faith from the inside. He was praying within his faith, but stretching it from the inside. And it was growing until finally he said, Lord, convert my neighbor. And he was converted. You got the message? Don't try and feel your faith. Don't try and force it, but stimulate it by studying answers to prayer, particularly in the Bible. And stretch it from inside by praying within your faith. Much better to pray for something small that you can believe. So that when God replies to your faith, your faith will grow that little bit and you'll pray for something more. You see, so often one, one listens to prayers, Lord, send revival to Guildford. And I want to stop that person and say, what is in your mind when you pray that prayer? What do you think will happen? And can you see that happening? Would it not be better to start with something you could believe would happen? That you can see happening? With the eye of faith, even though it's invisible to you yet, start within your faith, stretch it from inside. And now I must wind up. I'm going on far too long tonight. I'm going to give you just one other side to faith. Everything I've said so far is subjective, but let's look at the objective side now. The objective side is fatherhood. Fatherhood. You see, faith has to have content. It's got to be faith in, faith in. And my faith meets his fatherhood. For what is unique to Christian prayer, which you'll find nowhere else in the world, in no other religion, in no other holy scriptures, is this. One day, the disciples heard Jesus praying. Now, there were men who'd been brought up to say their prayers. There were men who knew what to say. But when they listened to Jesus pray, that was something different. 
And when he'd finished, they crowded round and they said, Lord, teach us to pray. They did not, thank God, say, Lord, teach us how to pray. They weren't asking for a method. They said, they were saying, Lord, could you teach us to talk to God like you do? Could you teach us to pray? And he said, yes, I can. When you pray, say, Abba. Abba. And for a Jew, that's a revolution. <laughs> for anyone, it's incredible. You go to all the people who don't come to church and say they believe in God. You count how many times they use the word Father about him. Not once. Not once. Oh, I believe in God, they say. I don't want you to think I don't believe in God. But they don't say the Father, do they? Of course they don't. Because they're not his children. And even the Jewish religion, which came nearer to the truth than any other, which prepared for the truth and was the foundation for it, they were so afraid of taking God's name in vain that to this day they won't pronounce it. And I got a Jewish man in Tiberias in the lounge there just a few weeks ago. I was talking to him and I tried to push him hard on this and hard as I pushed him, I couldn't get him to do it. I was trying to be sensitive in every other area, but I pushed him on this. I said, look, I never know when I'm preaching how to pronounce the name of God. Would you tell me? He was giving me a Hebrew lesson and he told me I should say Abraham and Isaac and Eliyahu and Moshe and, and I shouldn't say Jesus, I should say Yeshua and not Messiah but Mashiach and, and Israel. And he, he was giving me a Hebrew lesson so I said, right, now how do I pronounce the name of God? He looked as if I'd slapped him in the face. He said, I'll tell you the letters. So he told me the four letters which I knew anyway. I said, now how do I say those? Well, he said, Jews don't say it. But I said, if they did say it, how, how would they say it? <laughs> and I reckon I can prize things out of <laughs> some people some of the time. But I could not get anything out of him on this one. He said, uh, we sometimes use the word Lord, or we sometimes use just the phrase the name. And we say, you talk to the name. The name will hear you and the name will answer you. But he said, no, I'm not going to say the name. God's too sort of up there. And Jesus walked into that situation and he said, when you pray, say, Dad. For that's what Abba means. And you know, every party we take to Israel, somebody in that party gets the thrill of hearing that word used. Who was it this time? It was Adrian Seward. Where were you? Where are you? Wasn't it you? And I remember Adrian's face as he came up to me and he said, do you know what just happened? I just heard a child shout, Abba, Abba. Was it a little boy or a little girl? Or a little boy shouting to his daddy, Abba, Abba, Daddy, Daddy. It's the first word a Jewish boy is taught. And Jesus came and said, look, it's not a method, it's not a technique. I'm not going to give you a ritual. When you pray, say, Abba, Dad, you're his child. And here I'm going to talk about the use of hands in prayer. Because that part of the body is more used in prayer in Scripture than any other part of the body, even more than knees. Most prayer in Scripture is standing. Some is kneeling. All of it is with eyes open. There's nothing in the Bible about shutting your eyes. But the funny thing is that most in the Bible, the most used part of the body in prayer, apart from the mouth, is the hand. And you know, we saw the hand being used, as it should, by little beggar children, the Mount of Olives, do you remember? Allo. <laughs> little Arab children. And the hand was up, palm up, slightly cupped to catch anything that was put in allo. <laughs> allo. And it became almost a byword in the party, allo. But you see the position of the hand... Isn't it strange we teach our children to do something we adults never do? We teach them to use their hands in prayer. Why do we dare to teach them something we don't do ourselves? But we usually teach them the wrong posture. We teach them this. I've had various explanations as to why you do that. Uh, it is, of course, uh, an Eastern greeting to a superior. Some have said, I don't really believe it, but some have said you are creating a Gothic archway <laughs> as a sanctuary yourself and there are some people who can't pray unless the doors and windows are that shape you know it's astonishing and some say it's simply the gothic way but that's not the bible way the bible way is hello 
the bad way is dead. Try it when you're alone. Don't care whether you kneel, stand, sit, lie down. Just try using your hands. Say, Dad, I need you. Psychologists tell us we've got to grow up and mature and get rid of father fixations and become independent. I tell you, they couldn't be further from the truth. To mature is to change one father for another. To grow up and become a man is to change your earthly father for a heavenly one. That's what Jesus did at the age of 12. No longer was Joseph his father to look after him. No longer did his little hand go into Joseph's big one. Now he said, no, I'm with my father. I'm in my father's business. I've got a new dad. To grow up is not to become independent. It is to put your hand like a child in a bigger hand, the hand of God. And that is why prayer is a simple thing. That is why God says, if my people will humble themselves and pray. What does he mean? If they'll become like little children and put a hand up and just say this. And yet in this very building, a Christian in this church has said that when I raised my hands, this was fascism. And reminded them of the Nuremberg rallies. We're so afraid to lift hands. Yet the Bible everywhere says, clap your hands all you people. Lift your holy hands to the Lord. Now we met, make it into a metaphor, we spiritualize it away. But look, God knows we're in bodies. We're in the flesh, we're stuck with the flesh until we die. And we're, we're to pray as a whole being. So why not use your hands, keep your eyes open when you're alone and just lift your hands up and say, hello dad. I'll never forget a dear saint who visited Hazelmere about three years ago, four years ago, and he had a heart attack and was taken into Mount Alvernia Hospital where he died. And I visited him uh, over the last few weeks of his life. And his heart was doing all sorts of silly things and they put a pacemaker in to try and regularize it and it wasn't being regularized. And he asked me to pray for him that Jesus would regularize his heart and Jesus did. He answered that prayer from that moment. And from then on he had a heart that beat regularly until he died a few weeks later. So Jesus answered one prayer, but not in the full way that, uh, in fact, he didn't ask for anything more than that, just to ease this irregularity. But you know, that man had a fragrance about him. It wasn't a technique. It was practicing the presence. And you know, one day I went in to see him and he just looked at me and he said, uh, oh, it's good to see you. He said, I've just had such a lovely chat with Father. Isn't that beautiful? He said, I've just had such a lovely chat with Father. Not, I've just said my prayers. I've just been through my quiet time. I've just had such a lovely chat with Father. And it was the way he said Father. I'll never forget it. He had faith, that man. Tremendous faith. And it met the fatherhood of God. And so Christian prayer begins with this sentence, I believe in God, the Father Almighty. And while prayer is to a heavenly father, it's simple, it's talking, it's asking, it's coming as any little child would come to an earthly father and say, I need something. And I trust you to give it to me. And if you being evil know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more? How much more? You might like to use that as a little text or motto for your prayers this week. How much more? Let us pray. Father, Abba, Daddy, we may be very grown up when we get on that commuter train tomorrow, but we're just little children right now, and we will be then, and we need you, and Lord, we ask in faith that you'll be with us this week that you'll watch over us and look after us, that you'll see us through, and that any particular need we have, 
we know you'll meet it because you love us. Thank you for the privilege of being able to talk to you at any time and in any place, in any need, and all because your son made us his brothers and therefore gave us permission to call you our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive them that trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen.